So just before the uh, 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 this uh, talk, uh, I was uh, asking Robert about some of his things, and uh, I asked him if he was in Dresden, and he told me, yeah, almost all his life he was in Dresden, except for a few years where he went abroad uh, to Bavaria, uh, which is interesting, right? So, uh, so as as most of you know, like Robert has a very interesting career. Um, um, basically, uh, started as a, I guess, a computer scientist. By, by training and then slowly moved his way into biology through you know being a bioimage analyst. I guess like I, I won't uh, spend uh, a lot on, on Robert because most of you should know him from Twitter and his efforts uh, in image processing. So I, I don't think he needs much introduction, but, uh, but I, another thing I would like to say is he can be an uh, inspiration to a, a lot of people who, who don't have a typical career path and who want to experiment with different things and uh, so yeah, so Robert, looking forward to your talk and uh, I have great expectations from it, so yeah. Thank you, Kirti, for this very kind introduction. Um, if you can't see my screen now, please shout out loudly. <laughs> <clears throat> So thanks again for the for the introduction. Also thank you very much for the organizers for having me here today. Um, I will be talking about GPU accelerated 3D image processing for everyone. Um, I put so those of you who may have seen some of my talks and stories earlier, I put this 3D in here today into the title because I wanted to emphasize that especially for 3D imaging, this kind of technology makes a lot of sense, and I will show you a bit in detail why I think so. Um, but before I start, I would like to acknowledge. Um, a lot of people who support me in this. Um, so there's some, some faces you see here on top. There's people who contributed um, to the project, to the recent paper with data, with feedback, with code. Um, and there's uh, a lot of names on here. I'm just mentioning that if I would be sitting in my kitchen all day and coding something, then the product of that would look very different compared to what comes out when I collaborate with a lot of people and try to really like make it useful for a large crowd of, for example, biologists biophysicists and life scientists. <clears throat> so just to all get on the same page, yeah. so 3D image processing, and here you see actually a 3D data set over time, so it's actually 4D image processing, um, looks typically like that. So you see here um, tribolium embryo light sheet data set, and I'm duplicating a stack out of a single time point out of my time lapse. Um, and then I apply background subtraction. So, and I've spent now something between five and 10 years sitting in front of my computer waiting for processes like that to finish. So this, this video here plays in double speed. So in fact, it takes twice as long as what we have just seen, right? Um, and then I will do a maximum projection of that data set. So after, let's say a minute of waiting, I can see my actual sample. I can have a look at it from one perspective. Um, and then further process it, for example, for segmentation. And that's a bit of pity, it takes quite some time. Um, and that's why we developed this technology, which brings us closer to what I think how image processing should feel in a daily practice. So I'm still following the same steps. I do background subtraction and I do a maximum projection, but then afterwards I can go through my data set and see how these steps are applied in real time. Um, and that allows me to explore my data to a completely different degree. Instead of executing these individual operations, I can do a lot of stuff more or less in real time by just assembling these windows on screen. So how did it come there? So if you, if you read about GPU acceleration, that's, I mean, it's not a new technique, right? So the, the technology we are using here, OpenCL, um, was published in 2009. So we are talking about a technology which is older than 10 years. Um, and you, the internet is full of examples what you can do with that. So here, for example, you see a maximum projection written in OpenCL. And then there's books about it. You can accelerate everything. You just need to learn OpenCL, you know, right? Just, um, and then you translate your image analysis workflow into OpenCL. A lot of projects went down this road. Um, and I thought, let's do it a little bit differently. So I think that most of the end users working in the lab, life scientists, right, have no interest in learning OpenCL at all. Um, maybe curiosity, <laughs> but not for a daily practice, right? So that's why I implemented something like 300 of these operations. So here you see the maximum projection and there's 299 more. Um, and we all put them together 
uh, in, in, in a toolbox um, called CLIJ. So the CL uh, comes from OpenCL and the IJ comes from ImageJ. Um, and that was actually really a, a kink in my career, in my unusual career, according to Kirti. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was about Christmas in uh, 2018, I think. I put uh, on the image.sc forum, I put a thread and said something like, here, look, people, um, there's GPU accelerated image processing. What do you think about it? So I, I basically posted a message in a public forum and all the open source code and the tool um, before we actually started writing the paper about it. So it was for me a bit a risky moment, right? Some other could spoof me and I was really not afraid, but um, it was a bit exciting these days. So putting everything online first and then starting writing the paper about it was uh, at that moment in time, uh, not a clear path forward. And um, all the feedback I got from the people and then people tested it and, and, and gave me feedback and I could fix it. And, 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 turned out to be such a good idea. <laughs> so that I'm today super happy that I did it back in the days. But on the day when I posted that, I was really like a bit like, hmm, should I do this or shouldn't I? <laughs> Just mention it. <clears throat> so um, I could now talk a lot about benchmarking um, and how fast it actually is in very detail. You've seen earlier processes which take some time, suddenly run in real time. Um, so if you are interested in the benchmarking and the very technical details behind, I will just refer you to the other YouTube video of the New Bias Academy, which I talk, I gave something like a year ago. Um, there you find the benchmarking in very detail and you find it also in the paper we published about it. Today, just links because I would like to show you a bit more what you can do with it instead of, uh, is it now two orders of magnitude or 2.3 orders of magnitude faster, right? Who, who cares at the end? <laughs> um, so then we had to think about what should CLIJ2 bring? So what is the next generation of the thing which came out last year in summer? Um, so I, I put a lot of effort into studying tissues. So what you see here running over this uh, logo is actually a mitotic wave of a tribulium embryo, um, but analyzed and synthetically redrawn with some quantitative uh, visualization, right? And um, so neighboring uh, relationships between cells and tissues is obviously a research topic, which is very important in Dresden. Um, furthermore, there's a strong community out there using IC and also a strong community out there using MATLAB for image analysis. And I wanted to make the stuff available for them as well. So that's why CLIJ uh, comes with some sibling projects called CLATLAB and CLIC. Um, <laughs> you can basically call the same operations like in CLIJ, but from these two environments. And then the question came up, okay, what should CLIJ3 be? And um, on a conference also something like a year ago in Bordeaux, the question, the first question was kind of obvious, how about Python, right? Shouldn't it also be uh, compatible to Python? Yeah, I strongly agree. So it makes a lot of sense, but there is one question which is even more important. How about not coding? Because the people, many of my collaborators working in the lab um, with samples and microscopes and dishes, uh, many of them don't, code all day, right? So uh, some of them do and, and most of them actually don't. So how can we make this available um, to the people who do not code on a daily basis? That was kind of an important question for me. I wanted to reach them because they are the ones who know the best what to do with images. They are the ones with the biological question in mind. So we came up with um, an, a so-called assistant which is a Fitchy plugin, which allows to assisted uh, interactive design of image data flow graphs. So what is a image data flow graph? So you see here on the left, that's a Fitchy window, basically a normal Fitchy window with this gray frame, as you know, also here on the bottom, this is a normal Fitchy window. Um, and you see, this one is, is a, um, was acquired, maybe not with a microscope, a little bit blurry. And here on the bottom, you see the a perfect point spread function. I'm screwing up by convolution, basically, this perfect point spread function, and it looks a bit worse here. And then I feed, that's, that's the image flow, right? Image flow graph. The image flows along these lines um, into this window, which represents a Richardson-Lucy deconvolution. From the deconvolution, the image data flows further to a binarization. That's a thresholding algorithm, basically, um, down to connected components labeling, where you then see the objects in this image separated in different colors. And as you can see, the separation doesn't work very well. We cannot read the text. So I will now start this video and you will see me how I'm changing the parameters of this Richardson Lucy deconvolution. I'm increasing the number of iterations and the image becomes better. Also the segmentation becomes better, but it's still not possible 
to, to segment those. And now I'm changing the point spread function. I'm doing PSF engineering here. It's a bit, I'm tricking a bit around, but I think the principle of an image flow graph is very nicely explained here. Um, and in that way I can improve the segmentation. So that is some, some, this is some kind of operation or concatenation of operations I was always curious about. Typically we change the threshold, right? Or we run Richardson Lucy deconvolution twice because we are curious if it becomes better or not. But we can typically not in real time change these parameters and see the results to a segmentation immediately, right? But I should also mention here on this slide, super important, um, the Richardson Lucy deconvolution was programmed by Brian Northen, a colleague from Canada. Um, thank you, Brian, very much for doing this. Um, I'm not sure if I would have had the time for that and if I would have had the skills for developing it um, to a degree where people can just use it. So he programmed the, the deconvolution part and I have just been making it part of CLIJ basically. <clears throat> so and now we are coming to 3D image segmentation. So the deconvolution was just 2D, right? So here I'm showing a segmentation algorithm called Voronoi Ozu labeling, something like seeded watershed, no fancy stuff, just good old image processing, but in real time on a graphics card. Um, and you see here how I'm going through the, through the time lapse and how I can in 3D in planes look at the different results. And uh, especially when I go through time, the new segmentation result on this other time point is really computed more or less in real time here on my graphics card. So we are not going through a data set which has been segmented hours earlier on a cluster or something. No, this is happening here right now when I made the video, right? Um, and what you can also see, so you can inspect and you can tune parameters of this image segmentation while the image segmentation is happening. Um, what you also see here, when you look a bit deeply into this tribulum embryo, um, in the regions where we cannot differentiate cells anymore, um, also the algorithm cannot. So CLIJ does not bring new magic commands for image segmentation, it just, Take, gives you the good old image uh, processing commands we know already for years. I mean, also thresholding is 1979, yeah, 40 years old. <laughs> uh, but now on the graphics card um, and super fast, and you can tune the parameters more nicely because it is accessible in this real time fashion. Um, and um, back to the assistant. So, how do you set up these kind of workflows? Um, you have a right click menu in these green windows. And you have a right click menu. And for those of you who are not so experienced yet with image analysis, I would in very general always recommend to go from the top to the bottom in these different categories we have here. You typically start with noise removal and you typically do background subtraction next. And then at some point binarization, so making a binary image out of it, um, a mask um, and uh, then labeling. So then identifying individual objects. And then you have an, a label image, which looks like this, which is basically the same thing as an ROI, a region of interest in image J, but it's 3D. So you will in CLIJ find nothing or almost nothing about ROIs because we are working with label images because they are available in 3D. Um, and when you are then on a, such a label image and you right click, you see that the menu changes. So dependent on, on what kind of image you are looking at at the moment, the menu is a different one. It shows you different categories. It shows you different operations, which might be applicable to this particular data set you have in front of you. So, I mean, all of you may know that ImageJ Fiji has this huge amount of plugins and the menus are full of stuff and it's hard to keep an overview. And this is kind of an attempt to bring a bit structure into this. Um, all operations you find here um, are GPU accelerated, but you can also install some additional operations, so-called extensions, which are not GPU accelerated, but nevertheless fast and useful, I guess. <clears throat> Furthermore, there is another menu which suggests you additional steps. So these suggestions come from an expert system. Expert system, also a super old technology. Expert systems were invented in the 70s as a form of artificial intelligence. They were quite popular in the 80s um, and eventually made it now to Fiji. <laughs> you find this suggestion menu which um, looks into, into which operation was applied before and then into a database where typically following it, uh, operations are saved. So the database is made from, from, from scripts uh, from uh, Bram van den Broek in the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam and myself. Um, everybody who wants to volunteer is happy to join this database. I will show you later how you can. Um, and basically we try to extract knowledge out of the scripts we wrote over the years now um, and put it into this database so that basically everyone can follow the path we went down. And of course, 
the more people contribute to this database, the better the system will become. Um, so again, depending on, on what kind of image and what kind of operation you have applied before, the suggestions are different dependent on this database which was generated. Um, last but not least, in this context, if you cannot find an operation in the menus, it's still menus, right? And sometimes you may not know what's the category for this. Um, you can use the Fiji search bar. Um, just be careful, there is an additional category down here. Sometimes you have to scroll down. And you find the assistant commands not up here. There's a separate category for this on the bottom. Um, and now I'm, I'm showing some additional um, nice features. So for example, what you see here, I've set up a workflow, which approximately does a binarization. And um, obviously it's not perfect. So I'm going to annotate a bit ground truth. I'm drawing some green lines by clicking on the P button for positive, And then I'm drawing some magenta lines um, after clicking here on negative. And then I can ask the software to optimize the parameters of this workflow. So basically before I click on optimize on the bottom right, or when I click on optimize on the bottom right, the software will go up all the windows which are open and figure out which parameters are there and then optimize these parameters to get a, to get a better binary image fitting better to the ground truth annotation I did. And you can then afterwards also correct it. Um, I guess I'm showing that in the next step. Um, you can also draw on other images. So here I'm drawing some more, some additional nucleus and there I close this hole by drawing another annotation. And then you optimize parameters again um, to, to get a better segmentation. So this is, um, I'm using it from time to time. Um, and if people would provide me feedback how well this works on their screen and not just on my screen, it would be great. Um, and furthermore, if the optimization screwed up parameters, or if you yourself screwed up parameters, here I'm screwing up parameters, um, you can afterwards, uh, I think it takes some time to screw up parameters. Um, <laughs> you can afterwards, in the, also in the right click menu in the info and options section, find a history of parameters and you can go back in time. So this brings, still limited, but I think better than what we had before, that brings an undo function to image J, so you can undo parameter changes over time. Um, and here I am again showing how such a workflow is made. So here, um, thanks a lot to Elizabeth Kugler, who was providing the data, who was openly sharing data so that I can just use it without having to approach people and ask people about data. So um, open data is really good for software engineers, for, for computer scientists like me, um, because we need different kinds of data to make the good tools. Um, otherwise, we will forever process blobs.gif, um, which is also 20 or 30 years old. So what I'm doing here is um, I draw three maximum projections um, from Elizabeth's uh, Zebrafish data set, um, showing vasculature. Um, and then I was, I'm basically tuning some operations, a rigid transform to rotate this um, data set in the right order. And afterwards, I'm producing a script from it. So in this case, I'm producing an image J macro markdown script, which is some kind, um, after you execute it, it opens the browser, which is some kind of a notebook. Now you see the commands which correspond to the window on screen. And then you see the image which comes out of the command. So this is for learning this programming language behind may be helpful um, if you see what corresponds to what and what is the result of which command. Um, and that brings us uh, already to uh, in, in another project called um, Clasperanto. So Clasperanto um, brings us to answering this Python question. So Esperanto is a, I mean, Esperanto is this mixture of European languages, which are, which is supposed to be easily adoptable um, to people from these countries, from these language uh, space. Um, and CL Esperanto is basically thought as a bridge between the MATLAB community, the Fiji, Jiven, Macro community, Java community, um, and uh, the MATLAB community. So here you see this assembled screenshot basically tells us that these three communities write the same code. They all write CLE or CLIJX, here in this case, dot blur in order to blur an image, and then they can copy paste. So how often do I exchange with MATLAB people about their image analysis workflows because I cannot execute them in my Fiji? Um, and how often do Python people copy an image J macro to translate it? So this is like, this translation should go away. We should be able to, to exchange code more easily. And this is what the Casperanto project is aiming for. The idea is to make code easily exchangeable on top of this GPU acceleration stuff. And that allows us to do some cool things. 
So here you see um, Fiji, and I again have set up a workflow for segmentation of my um, tri-volume data set. And I now have chosen a different entry in this code generation pull down. So this is Python, and it's not Fiji Jython, it is Python. Um, in order to execute it, I have to select the right entry, um, and then it runs Python in the background, starts basically Python and executes it. And here in this case, we will see how in a second the software called Napari pops up. So I have now from this workflow on screen, from these Fiji windows, um, I have generated Python code and this Python code starts Napari, loads my image and shows the, all these intermediate processing steps. Then of course, you can afterwards modify this Python script, but you can also just use Napari in order to go through your data set in 3D. So it really like, I mean, you will see it in a second. Um, and that makes, of course, inspection of segmentation results much easier. So depending on the use case, what you want to do with your data and what oper also what operations you need, the Python part does not have all the operations we have on the Java side yet. Um, but depending on your use case, you may want to do things in Napari and depending on the use case, you may want to do things in Fiji and you may want to exchange easily between these platforms. So this is just a quick introduction to how to generate code from Fiji that runs Napari. Um, and you can also do something similar from Napari. So here you see Napari in action, and this is the Napari Pike Esperanto assistant. <laughs> so it's basically the same idea. You also see here categories, noise removal, background removal, other filters, binarization, labeling. So it's the same thing, just user interface looks different. And I was just binarizing and labeling this data set. Um, so, and afterwards, and yeah, here the, here the cool thing is you can rotate this around, right? You cannot do this in Fiji. So sometimes you may want to do something like that in Napari. Um, and afterwards, you can also here generate code. And the special thing about this kind of code is, um, which can also be generated in Fiji. So I spent a lot of effort on this. It executes in Fiji. <laughs> so in Napari and in Fiji, you can generate code, which is basically executable in Jython, which is the language, the scripting, one of the scripting languages behind Fiji and Python. And it's exactly the same code. So it makes basically our life easier. We can just exchange code between Fiji and Napari. Um, and uh, I hope this will become a thing at some point so that we can easier uh, bridge these communities and work together on fast workflows for 3D image processing, right? Um, yes. Speaking of Napari, um, there was recently a call by Lucy. Lucy works for the um, uh, Chang Zuckerberg Initiative, and she's basically responsible for collecting user feedback, user experience, um, and um, discussing with the developers of how to implement these things. So she was announcing a, some kind of a survey online. I mean, it's, it's not a survey, you're joining a, some kind of a mailing list and then they are setting up a meeting um, where they want to find out how they might best help biologists. So that's what they say on the website. So please, if you have time, if you think Napari and Python is a cool thing and you want to kind of help them in making it happen, um, please join this initiative and provide feedback and guide them into the right direction. Um, I think it's it's excellent that they have people taking care of that in particular, right? There's not so many open source projects out there where there is somebody paid for collecting user feedback and putting it into the decision uh, system of the developers. Um, back to code generation and uh, class Peranto and Fiji. So you can here select multiple programming languages. The upper half is basically stable, so you can use these things, and I would say they will just work in the very most cases. The lower half is a bit experimental, especially all the Clasperanto stuff. Clasperanto is, we are planning for next year the release, so this is an early alpha release, basically. Play with it, provide feedback, but maybe do not build your current research projects on top of this. Um, and from this menu, you can generate image to macro, and you can generate Python, and you're doing this after you did you, you build up your image analysis workflow. I think that's practical. I think that's useful because you can then compare macro and Python. And also uh, compared to the image the macro recorder, we all know, it is not recording the steps we do um, by chance. It is just outputting the workflow after the workflow was made. Um, so also here, um, please try all these things out. Let me know what you think. I'm happy to improve this. Um, I'm also happy to kick out menu entries from this menu in case some stuff is not used at all, right? So we don't have to maintain things which are not useful for people. So please feel free to, to provide feedback about that. 
And what I also want to mention, because it is actually quite important, we will also support C++. It will actually be the backbone of the Clasperanto project. Um, it's programmed by Stefan Rego in the Institute Pasteur. Um, and I'm very happy um, that he is on board for this um, because he's a fantastic software engineer making these things happen on the very bottom while I can concentrate a little bit more on the user interface and um, making it more applicable to more people, right? So future direction. So we have now image segmentation. I mean, image segmentation is, is a fascinating thing, but there's many groups worldwide working on this, right? So you start from some, oh, my animation, you start from some filtered image, then you segment it, then you do some post-processing. Um, that's that's semi-interesting for me and my research, right? I'm actually interested in what can we do with such segmented images afterwards? Because there's a huge universum of things uh, we may not be exploiting the right way yet, but um, we are on the way. So what you can do, um, you can draw quantitative images from these kind of images. For example, you can uh, trivial measure intensity and standard deviation of intensity. You can measure distances and average distances between cells, between the centroids of cells here in this case. Um, you can also measure how many neighbors they have. So that's basically an abstract measure of the topology of these cells. Um, and you can measure their shape. And if you take all these things together, I mean, all these individual measurements may be interesting. And uh, sometimes cells are more dense and then in the clinical histology lab, they say, okay, it's cancer or uh, it's healthy tissue. Or here we say it's embryo and it's a rosa and it's right? So these individual parameters are interesting, but it becomes actually interesting when you take all these parameters together and put them into a machine learning tool. So here you see um, K-means clustering, also a very old machine learning technique which separates um, all these cells into here, in this case, in three different groups. You can also post-process these clustering result and then visualize it in a different way. Um, and it wouldn't be me if this is no video. Um, and then you can uh, change the parameters of the clustering, of the segmentation, of how these parameters were measured and so on and so on. So again, this is not new. There's other software uh, out there, uh, more for graphics, cytomap. So there's other tools which allow you to do these kind of things. Um, but I'm afraid none of them allows you to set up the whole image processing workflow in two parameters and see how they influence the final result. And I think there are some lessons to learn on this road um, before we can then actually basically reach the next level. Yeah? Just imagine this clustering algorithm I show here, just imagine is as simple to use as threshold O2. And we can then build tools on top of this. So this is where I would like to go research-wise and therefore we have to have easy user interfaces to explore these tools to finally to, to better understand them and then eventually build more awesome stuff on top. Uh, so before I close, I'm almost through, and I'm also almost running over time. I will just quickly show you how to glitch. <laughs> so if you want to install it in Fitchy, you have to activate these three update sites. And there is a fourth update site, the uh, glitch assistant um, extensions. If you want to activate the extensions, please read this short section on the website about how to do this, because there are some additional steps necessary. Otherwise, which you may have an issue. Uh, Linux users have to install a proper OpenCL driver. That's sometimes a bit tricky, but uh, in the very worst case, approach your IT department and they can help you with that. So it's, it's definitely solvable. It's just a driver you need to install. Um, if you want to install it to Napari, there is an, also a plugin installer in the Napari um, software. There is this install button you can click here. Um, in this case, the Windows users may have an issue. <laughs> so please go to the website and read a bit the more details about how to install PyOpenCL, which is a dependency we need here. And there's the installation, unfortunately, a bit more complicated. Um, the website is full of tutorials. So here, I would like to thank Dani, who helped me writing all those. Um, we explain all the basics, but we also explain the more sophisticated stuff, how to do the segmentation and the quantitative analysis. It's all basically for the scripting, but you also find the same tools in the assistant. You can also do the same thing interactively. Um, we have on the on website also cheat sheets. So I am a very visual person. I do not, I do not hang around on the command line very often, um, but uh, I look, in, for example, into these documents and I see here, okay, uh, I want to do some edge extraction thing. So I may need the filter like this one or like that one when my input looks like that. And then you find here, ah, Laplace, ah, difference of Gaussian, right? So dependent on what you want to see, what you want to do from the cheat sheets, you can read a bit how these operations are called. 
I hope it's useful. Um, furthermore, you get support on image.sc. If you have an issue with CLIJ, just post there. I was recently posting there because I'm actively asking for support from the community. There's a lot of experimental functions which are not officially released yet, but available to the community. And I wanted to know which of those are used and which are those are useful, um, perceived by the community. So please go there and join this poll and, and, and put your opinion there so that I have a better picture of what's happening out there. And on the right, you can contribute to the expert system. So you can extract with this little, it's basically also a Fiji plugin. It will extract from a folder of CLIJ macros. It can extract what you typically do. And then you can send that to us without sending us your potentially confidential macros. So you also see what will be sent to us. So it's opt-in to no data protection issue at all, right? Um, but you can send us things like that. So if you use CLIJ for some time and you have a folder of scripts at some point where you do stuff, um, then consider joining this uh, initiative here. I would be very, very glad if you do so. Um, almost last but not least, um, I just became group leader. So I will have some positions in my lab. Um, and we also have this other postdoc fellowships at the Center for Systems Biology, where I'm still affiliated. Um, here you can join if you want to do some kind of um, more or less independent postdoc. So you are a senior postdoc, you know how science is done, and you think, hey, at the Center for Systems Biology, they have cool theory, they have cool biology, and they have cool image analysis, maybe. <laughs> Um, and I would like to do something interdisciplinary between these fields, and I would like to do it more or less independent. Still working with labs, right? But uh, you are working between the labs. You are not, there's no PI telling you what to do. You are basically the PI, <laughs> but you can go to the one lab and to the other lab to get the best out of theory, to get the best out of biology, and to get the best out of um, image analysis, for example. So if this sounds like something you would like to explore, um, check out the website, get in touch. Um, that is a big opportunity, I think. And soon we will also have more positions on the Physics of Life website, the institute where I just joined. Um, this institute is new. There are a lot of groups starting, so you can actually assume that in the future there will be more open positions also in my lab. Not yet online, but soon. <laughs> um, last but not least, please cite it. There was this Nature Methods paper uh, a year ago. And we have two more preprints telling you how to translate your workflows into the GPU accelerated versions and how to use this interactive user interface. Um, and with that, I would like to thank again all the people standing behind me, helping me with that. And I also thank you for um, your attention and for the questions you will hopefully have. <clears throat> Thanks, Robert, for the great talk. Um, we have a lot of questions and uh, what we will do is, hopefully Stephanie has prepared the Mentimeter quiz. Uh, of and course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can go through the questions first. That's maybe more important, or do you think? We can go through the quiz and then uh, we can do the questions and it will also give Robert a bit of break. But if you need time, we can do the questions. Like. No, I'm always ready for a Mentimeter. So I'm just, um, <laughs> I think so. I can quickly answer some questions uh, which, 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 which are in the chat. Why are you preparing? So will this work on integrated GPUs rather than dedicated? Yes. <laughs> I spent a lot of effort on this. I really, I, I'm happy that the, that the answer is yes here. Um, and the other question, uh, ATI and NVIDIA GPUs. So ATI, I'm not sure if they are still available, but AMD, NVIDIA, Intel works. Um, and the last question I have to read a bit more in detail to understand. So maybe we go through the quiz first. <laughs> <laughs> so we have very few people who got COVID vaccines. So that's a nice question for a Is it working now? Yeah, no. Yes, it's okay. Oh, I'm just curious. I mean, it's very confidential. So nobody has to reveal who they are. I'm just thinking, we hope this community obviously is going to go back to the labs and you know, working together. I mean, especially, I mean, I was thinking when listening to Robert, I mean, your work is so incredibly community driven and interactive and collaborative. So, I mean, I guess a lot of it can be done remotely, but just still, I think it's just, uh, I just think it would be, I can see that quite a few people haven't actually been, but we just have great hope that um, obviously here things are going really fast. We're all going to be together soon. Not that we want to lose the imaging one world community, but I guess um, we really like to go back to the lab. 
I think it's yeah. this is the first time we have over 50 people. I know, we have lots of people now. Now I'm getting really nervous that I'm, I've done it, obviously. <laughs> I remember, Robert, we had about like 350 registrations. I know, it was amazing. It's a new today. record. We're just, it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, like super popular this today. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was also before I put my first lecture on YouTube I wasn't aware that YouTube and lectures fit together. <laughs> People who don't know this lecture will be online um, uh, on, on YouTube uh, by today evening or tomorrow at the latest so you can watch it again. So yeah, questions are coming now. Yeah. So here this is the community now here for the um for well, the Mentimeter quiz and also, I mean, just in case, I think there are some people who have never done this with, uh, at least not with Imaging One World, um, as faster you answer, it's more likely you're going to win the fold scope. So it's not just the correct answer, but okay. So this was a little bit of a language thing for me <laughs> as well. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. I'm not going to read this. So, but you see what it's heading for. And if you listened carefully to Robert's um, fantastic talk, you should be able to answer. So your time is up and 32 Yay. people got it right. So, so now pressure is on. I mean, it's not just getting the answer right, but it's actually, you know, doing it quick as well. And, and to keep things interesting, we sometimes uh, have the wrong answers correct also. So that everyone in life... I know, that was quite like weird. Um, I did, that was the weirdest. <laughs> With Benedict, that was just bizarre. That was, I think... Um, um, I'm sorry, enter. I mean, Robert, you can also comment if you wish, but um, maybe it's better to keep people concentrated on the um, amazingly I mean, difficult. I, um... I, I, can, I can just read out, even though we are half through now, I can also spend some more time about thinking of reading it out. <laughs> it <times up. laughs> it's okay, I think. <laughs> so again, 42 people question. got it right. So now it's getting really tight. So make okay, sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely realizing that the questions were too simple. So let's see if oh, there's no, a more complicated think, question. On but there are some very difficult, especially the last one will be extremely difficult, I know. <laughs> so with which programming language is Clasperato compatible? With Java, with Python, or with Java and Python? <clears throat> I think the intonation was a bit of a giveaway there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. Again. Oh, oh yeah. my God. This is going to be <laughs> the most spectacular Mentimeter show ever. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that this thing exists. I think I will do this now forever in all my talks by the end. It's oh, fun. You don't know what you're getting into because... <laughs> How is the user so, interface called for CLIJ and Casperando? Is it the assistant, the wizard, or Clippy? <clears throat> This is a bit of a uh, interesting. All right. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Aha. So we lost a few people now on the way. So 23 yeah. only got the system, right? Which um, I think Clippy was a bit of a too cute a name. I think people were hoping it's called Clippy. So I think you should yeah. maybe rename it. Yeah, I'm not sure and now this is the most difficult one. Rights. So this is oh, the yeah. most difficult one, especially. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you know me. So, because, I mean, there's some, I feel extremely humbled and honored to be even considered in this kind of answer possibility. <laughs> so thank you. And I added another lady, as you may have noticed. <laughs> yeah, she, is, she is one of the first computer scientists, right? What did, what yeah. did she work on? Let me just see. Um, so I think I've, I've heard her name earlier, but I unfortunately forgot. Was she was she working on the Enigma? Maybe. <clears throat> no, she was not for you. No, you no, have no. to figure it out by next question. <laughs> so just um, all right. So we have like um, so the winner had this cute um name Hola Hop. We don't actually know who the winner is, so you need to send me an email or you need to put your name into the um, the chat so that we can send you the um, 
the wonderful fold scopes the ones you won some of the people who won before so i don't despair I, they are on their way they are just kind of changed now to the rms have actually very kindly offered that they will actually send them so the fold scopes are only three pounds fifty but the poor um, sending them depending where you are at the moment sending them out of the uk has probably become more expensive but the Royal Microscopic Society has been very kindly offered to do this. And so I've actually transferred all of this to them and they will forward the full scope. So don't despair. You, they are on their way. You're not forgotten. But whoever hula hoop is, please let us know. Well, and, Stephanie, uh, we again have Francisca Decker. I think this is fourth or fifth time uh, she has won it. So Francisca, if you want to say a quick few words. Oh, yeah. Can, uh, I think you uh, need to ask at least then a very good question. <laughs> Or at least you can tell the secret of uh, how you are able winning. To yeah, yeah, almost like I think. I don't know if this is the fourth or the fifth time you have won it, right? So congratulations. I think it's the fourth now. Well, I mean, the trick is to be just fast. But then, also, <laughs> but then also, since I've been in Dresden for my PhD, I'm really like familiar with the stuff that Robert does. So it's also kind of easy today. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, that's very how, nice. did you, how did you manage to have a rabbit there at the end as a as, as, uh, face? Oh, um, uh, it just like randomly selects like whatever okay. animal or sign. And then I usually don't change the name. And okay. so that was just what Mentimeter suggested. <laughs> okay. So for, for those of you who don't know, my last name is basically the German word for rapid with a typo. So that's why that oh, was yeah, that's was ex extra yeah. cool for me. Oh, that is very funny, actually. Yeah, that is very nice, actually. Must be some kind of AI algorithm of listening and then assigning kind of a winner. Okay. <laughs> Should we go through the more? I mean, there were quite a few questions. People who don't know, Ada Lovelace was an English mathematician, worked with Charles Babbage on analytical engine. I cheated slightly from Wikipedia. So, um, so, so Robert, I will uh, start with the questions now. And uh, one of the questions I have is um, coming from a lot of microscopy labs, like most of them, the softwares are like very reconstruction analysis are in MATLAB. And since you had this great MATLAB background, is there a easy way to, let's say, you know, uh, get the existing MATLAB codes, somehow what you have done for Python and Java. Uh, I don't know, maybe you have already done it and, and I missed it. I mean, in, in MATLAB itself, we did not spend any effort in making a user interface there yet. I mean, yet, maybe we will never do this, right? Um, but what you can do, you can build up these workflows on screen, which replicates basically your workflow you have in MATLAB and then export MATLAB code. Um, so this is maybe the, the easiest way to approach this. Um, yeah, I think I think that's maybe the way to go. If you roughly know what your workflow is doing, I mean, anyway, you have to translate it, right? So you should know what your workflow is doing. <laughs> um, so you build it up again and export it to MATLAB. <clears throat> no, that's true. But I think like, uh, while like, you know, a lot of now, like, um, let's say the hardware, uh, like Android or can also PIM in flux, uh, PIM in flux. So there are new softwares in Python. So hopefully the trend will change in the next 10 years but uh, towards Python. But do you still think like uh, uh, something else? But let's just skip to maybe some more questions from the audience because this is- I mean, in, in very general, there is some, there's some movement, you're right. So there is people switching to Python, but I also met people from time to time who switched to MATLAB. Um, and uh, the only way of kind of um, simplifying this is having, for example, a common language and making these things more compatible. There was also recently a talk, which should also be on YouTube, that you can execute MATLAB from Python and Python from MATLAB. So this yeah, is the way to go. All these tools are converging, and that makes our life the, at the end, the end users of these programming languages, right, easier. So I'm looking forward to the next 10 years. It will be fun. <laughs> I mean, speaking practically, like uh, we have some, some, some of the code in Micromanager and even though I know Python and uh, possibly I can program in Java, but you know, I start with uh, sometimes Andrew York's code and, but I eventually end up doing in MATLAB because there's so much uh, big base, you know, that I find it like, who, who cares? Like, I just want to get the job done rather than, you know, moving to us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that has been the biggest hurdle for me because all my, like from my masters, 
uh, uh, you know, whether it was machine learning, bioinformatics, right up to PhD, postdoc, everything was in MATLAB. So, mm -hmm. and I don't see it changing anytime soon because, you know, people who are moving towards Python, so Fiji is, is, is good, but still like, uh, yeah. It depends a bit on which institute you are, right? So there's institutes where they do everything with Fiji. <laughs> <laughs> I think image analysis is, is like still I open images in Fiji, but for for you know the microscopy hardcore microscopy stuff uh, and analysis. Um, so let's just start with the question. So Alexander, you have a question, right? Um, oh no, okay, it, it was a comment. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can, but I didn't book my slot, so browse through the others. <laughs> so uh, Arthur, uh, I think he's also in Dresden. He asked, like, I wonder if. I don't know if you all already answered this, but this question is, I wonder if image, uh, image data flow graph may be compatible with model-based rather than pixel-based image analysis technique. For example, one such technique is also developed in Dresden and it's called adaptive particle representation. So CLIJ is really focused on pixels, um, pixels and voxels, right? So OpenCL has some really nice hardware acceleration for accessing pixels and neighborhoods of pixels. Um, and that's what we are exploiting here. So basically, basically, and it's a, a case of an alternative to the adaptive particle representation, you could say, um, that we have this fast hardware access so that we can process many pixels in parallel. And then we do not need this ab abstraction anymore. But what I'm also what I also want to say here is, of course, it would make a lot of sense to make these things nicely work together. I think a part of the adaptive particle representation was GPU accelerated at some point. And so making these things work uh, tightly together and then exploiting the best bo of both of them in the right scenario would be great, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, the next question is from Anjali uh, Shalpi. Uh, so she asks, can uh, Pledge uh, run on servers with many users sharing a GPU? For example, let's say the Google Colab or something like yeah. that. So on Google Colab, I tried it at some point and I couldn't figure it out, but I was, it was really like me not being very experienced here. So if you want to try it and you just need assistance, um, which driver has to be installed and so on, I'm happy to join a Zoom session, for example, that we can do that together. Um, what I would recommend a bit more because it's easier, um, if your institute has access to a high performance compute center, some cluster, um, you can typically book interactive GPU nodes, that's the term there, um, and that means you have basically one GPU for yourself on a remote computer. These GPUs are typically very expensive and have a lot of memory and are super fast. So <laughs> you may want to book one of these nodes interactively and then, for example, open a remote Jupyter notebook or open a remote uh, image J, for example. And then you see the windows on your screen, but the computation is running on this expensive computer in the university. So this is something which is easier to exploit. And I I think also more powerful. Uh, the next question is, how do you ex expect compatibility performance with non uh, x86 based architectures? Example, RM, ARM based uh, devices are becoming more common. Very good question. I thought I don't have to dive into this. Um, and uh, I was I was afraid that I have to dive into this and fix it myself, but there was uh, somebody on the internet, um, I forgot his last name, Peter from the Czech Republic. <laughs> uh, he made CLIJ run um, on an ImageJ on, in, on one of these new Apple ARM M1 laptops. It was not very complicated, he said. It was a short Twitter thread about that. And um, he explained a bit what he was doing. And it boils down at the end to OpenCL is a standard between all these platforms. And that's why typically if a device is OpenCL compatible, then you can also easily run um, CLIJ on them. That might not be true for the Android phone because you cannot run an image J on a phone or not yet, let's see. Um, but basically everything that is OpenCL compatible is then also compatible to CLIJ if again, image J or Python runs. <clears throat> so uh, Arthur, Seamus and others, thank you for the great talk and our faithful followers of your work like me. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, thank you messages. It's very uh, nice. People also feel like they would like to wish in Dresden now. So I think you, um, you kind of uh, created a trend here. <laughs> so, 
Again, there will be open yeah. positions. Again, there will be open positions. Actually, know, a lot. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So um, just reach out and have a look a bit on the website. There is also there will be group leader announcements, and then these group leaders at some point will also have job announcements. So it will happen a lot in the next years. I think. Mm. I think, Robert, we have still uh, four, five minutes. So, people, if you have any questions, you want to see any live example or anything, I can ask you, Robert, another question. Since you are coming from computer science and you have to deal with uh, a lot of biologists, possibly clinicians, over this last, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years, what have been your biggest challenges, let's say, you know, uh, uh, switching in different domains? Uh, yeah. yeah, that is, I mean, switching between the domains. So, if you, I mean, me as a computer scientist, so I worked in a company, I worked as a software developer, then I studied computer science, so there was no big switch. <laughs> um, then I moved on to the medical faculty where I developed software, there was also not so much a big switch. And then um, switching from medical imaging to biological imaging, still developing software is not so much a big switch. That's why um, that all is basically okay. So as long as you still have this one thing you carry with you, this red line in your CV, I'm developing software for 25 years now. Um, so you should do this. Um, and um, sometimes, especially as a software developer, what was a struggle a bit on the way was when I did my PhD, something like 10 years ago, they told us you cannot publish software because software is no science. Mm. Um, and this changed in the last 10 years. So suddenly you can have a Nature Methods publication about image processing, right? Um, the Fiji publication is already nine years old now with a lot of citations. So basically the idea of having software citable and that software is crucial for science is now in the head of everyone. Um, and what we still have to master a little bit better than we do now is also having the funding opportunity. So I'm now a group leader. And I'm looking for how to how to fund my research, right? And when you go through these funding agencies, what they offer on their website, um, it's typically basic research, clinical research, but not software. So there is still one step to go. Um, I'm not saying that I'm struggling here. I think it will work out nicely. <laughs> but in five years or so, I can tell you how I managed that. <laughs> so... There's actually the Zuckerberg Foundation funding is pretty cool, actually. They're um, one of the big one of the places or one of the organizations which really fund actually these developments no i mean you mentioned that as well yeah so they, they are they are one of them also the the, yeah. the german um research foundation the dfg um does that and the, the ample now with the arise program so you find multiple mm. opportunities but if you think about how many software is out there and which packages are actually crucial for science like for example numpy yeah, mm. used by millions of scientists worldwide and how many funded staff positions are behind that one mm -hmm. <laughs> right? that's really amazing yeah <laughs> so there, is I it also something like, should um, happen here yeah also in terms of um ip protection like patent filing and is that also going to change what is your experience there i mean is that yeah, some, I, I mean i don't know in one way it's actually contradictory or contra contrary to what you're doing because you're very open source but on the other side i guess it's also a value to a software is kind of I think what here has to change or has to change what is changing already you see that when you when you for example as a scientist work together with startups um, founded by other scientists um, mm. what, what you see often is now that companies contribute to open source projects openly Mm -hmm. um, and then build services on top of that. So for example, I could now found a company and say, hey, I will GPU accelerate your image analysis workflow, just send me your macro. I mm -hmm. would have a great time. Um, <laughs> and it would also be very boring. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there are models which work, right? So it is possible and, and companies are slowly understanding that. And I would say it's rather the small companies at the moment, it's not the big mm -hmm. ones. Uh, maybe the big ones change their mind as well or others will become big at some point. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, there is like the. Um, yes. So there is like a, one of my former colleagues, Patrice uh, Mascalci, works for Ivia. Ivia, mm -hmm. I think it's pronounced. Um, and that's kind of, I think, a small company does exactly that. So they're kind of working for people or with people, but you obviously have a pay kind of contract. But that's quite nice. Before, uh, I have one question from some discussions we had within the group as well. Do you have an image which um, you have seen, which has inspired you through your life as a scientist? Do you have like an image where you looked at the image and you felt, oh my God, this is going to tell me so much more? 
Yeah. But I actually had the opportunity during my PhD. So my, my PhD supervisor, so my the head of the lab where I did my PhD is a radiologist, um, Nasreddin Abul Mali. Um, and we had on Mondays, sometimes we had the chance to use the MRI for teaching purposes. So students were going there. One of the students was then volunteering and the other students had to look into the head. So I have an MRI of my own head from that time. <laughs> um, and that's a data set which I sometimes um, get out again and have a look at it in, in very detail. And maybe we should also every five years take another MRI and then measure where the image analysis region in the brain is growing. <laughs> it would be super interesting. Sample well, size hopefully, n hopefully. equals one. <laughs> hopefully, uh, 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 let's see if this creates at some point. Uh, well, that's very <laughs> um, nice. Thank you. <laughs> there's, there's another question by Martin Jones, which yeah. just came up in the chat. Uh, sure. Martin is asking if uh, formats like ZAR or N5 for really big data sets are supported. And so CLIJ itself and Casperado as well has no support for file formats. It just takes pixels. Um, but we are working together with, uh, I mean, working together with Stefan Saalfeld. Stefan Saalfeld was posting some code on the Image AC forum, um, and I answered him, so we are working together there in a thread Hello. on making Hello. big data working. Yeah. Excellent. I'm not too bad, and you guys, how are you all? Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you, uh, Martin, if you search for multi GPU um, and uh, uh, CLIJ in the forum, in the image.sc forum, you will find a thread where me and Stefan are basically discussing how to open N5 files and apply GPU accelerated image processing to it. <clears throat> so, Lord, we are almost through. Uh, we still have a minute left. And uh, yeah. Yeah. No. But I think it's a good time to call it off. Thanks for the great talk. And uh, Thanks for having me. For all this that was very amazing. Yeah. That was fantastic. It was really inspiring. I think we could have stayed like another hour kind of going through some <laughs> stuff. Just oh, there's, for... there's, on, there's on YouTube the I2K session um, since two weeks or so online. It's four hours uh, of Stefan Rigaud and me talking. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Your fans will be <laughs> oh, joining you. That's wonderful. <laughs> Can you send us the link? Do um, you have the link? And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's in the slides actually <laughs> oh, okay yeah okay no i saw okay then that's that's true <laughs> no that's wonderful thank you okay, well, then. Uh, yeah. thanks for having me and have thank you very much week, and i think we're all kind of wanting to move to dresden now so <laughs> yes. come come <laughs> <laughs> we will Bye -bye. close thank to you. berlin so you might yeah very much thank hope you. we see you soon in person <laughs> yeah yeah, we will manage at some point. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> bye, bye. Thank you. Wiedersehen. Tschüss. Tschüss. <laughs>